All right. And I now would like to welcome Emily Penn and Kelly Moore of Ripple Wellness. Thank you. I'll go ahead and share my screen and get the presentation started. Let's see here. All right, let me just. Okay. okay. Thanks so much for joining us tonight, everybody. My little presentation loaded here. Um, I'm Dr. Kelly Moore and Emily Penn is joining me tonight. She's a functional nutritionist and we're going to be talking about blood sugar, which is something I talk about with almost all my patients, something I think is really important. So I'm excited to share this with you tonight. But before we get started, let's just set some intentions for this conversation that we're having. This is going to be about learning, take an inventory of how you feel and your lifestyle about being inspired and empowered. It's not going to be about you needing to be perfect or me judging you or you judging yourself or what you should be doing. Oftentimes those feelings of judgment and should um, come up when we talk about lifestyle. And I really don't want that to be um, the way you feel about when you hear tonight's information, just take it in. And um, we're going to be giving you some really practical tips that you can take away and apply really easily to your life to make a big difference in your blood sugar balance. Um, I am a physician, but I I'm probably not your physician. Um, so um, this information is just for educational purposes only. If you want to dive into this a little bit deeper, um, we give you some options for that at the end of the uh, talk. And you can, of course, always do that with your own provider as well. So I'm a naturopathic physician. I have a practice at Ripple Wellness that focuses on the prevention and treatment of chronic disease, um, particularly digestive, hormonal, and metabolic disorders, focusing on using lifestyle medicine um, to treat those. And then Emily. So my name is Emily, and I am a functional nutritionist functional nutritionist, certified in functional nutrition. Um, and I've had the privilege working at Ripple Wellness and working with a variety of health concerns. So anything from diabetes, um, digestive issues, hormonal and fertility concerns, autoimmune disorders, um, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, all of that stuff. And then I have a special interest in, um, the connection between food and mental health, which blood sugar actually plays a big role in. And we will learn about that in just a little bit here. Yeah. And then Ripple is a multidisciplinary clinic in Washugo, as well as naturopathic medicine. We have acupuncturists, massage therapists, a nutritionist. We have a mental health counselor and um, yoga experts. And we do regular community classes. So if you're interested in being kept in the loop on those classes, then um, put your email in the chat and we'll add you to um, our email list. Um, all right, so let's dive into it and we'll start by just understanding what a carbohydrate is. That term gets thrown around a lot and I want to make sure we're all on the same page. So, um, glucose, all carbs come from glucose and glucose comes from plants. Plants use the energy from the sun with carbon dioxide and water to make glucose. And as part of that, that process, they also make oxygen, which allows all of us to be here. So plants, Plants are pretty awesome. They um, use glucose as their prioritized source of energy, and so do we. So animals and plants um, prioritize glucose for energy. We can also burn ketones, which come from fat, but our body prefers to burn glucose. Um, without glucose, there would not be life. So we're going to talk a lot about um, what happens when we have too much glucose, but I want to acknowledge that we need glucose. It's important. It's not bad. It's just, it can cause problems when we have too much. So some of those problems, um, when we have too much glucose, they overwhelm the little energy factories in our cells called mitochondria. And what happens when they get overwhelmed is they make free radicals and free radicals wreak havoc in our body. They cause oxidative stress, which ends up causing tissue damage, which ignites our immune system, which ends up causing more damage and is at the root of chronic disease. And a good way to think about this is to think about a steam train, which runs on coal. And you have the guy shoveling the coal into the engine and he has his bucket of coal next to him. And he always needs that to be pretty full. And he shovels more coal into the engine when he wants the train to go faster. And he shovels less coal when he wants the train just to chug along. 
then you need someone to be filling up that coal bucket. But if someone came in and just started dumping a ton of coal into the engine room and he didn't want the train to go too fast. So he didn't want to put it in the engine. That engine room is just going to fill up with coal and everything in the engine room is going to get dirty and full of coal dust. And it's just going to be a huge mess. And that's essentially what we do to our poor little mitochondria. When we overwhelm them with glucose, they get overwhelmed and, um, can't use it all. And so it ends up creating damage in our cells. Another thing that happens is that when glucose is just roaming around through our blood freely, it causes damage. When it bumps into other molecules, it does this thing where it glycates them. And you can imagine like if you get covered in syrup and, and that syrup dries, you whatever gets covered in the syrup is going to get sticky and hard. And the same thing happens to our molecules. When it bumps into glucose, it gets glycated. This is an irreversible process that is part of living. It can't be helped, but we can speed up the process, which we don't want to do when we have too much sugar. And then we can also slow down that process when we don't give our bodies too much sugar. So um, our normal fasting glucose levels um, are, well, glucose levels are considered normal at fasting when they're under 100. However, in healthy non-diabetic individuals, the average fasting glucose is actually between 80 to 86. So that's where I like to see my patients' blood sugar. Normal is kind of just what's common. Anything over 126 fasting blood sugar, that's when you get into diabetes. But really healthy people are looking at blood sugar levels, fasting blood sugar levels that are closer to 80 to 86. All right, so what do plants do with the sugar that they make, the glucose that they make, they can't have it roaming around freely in their tissues, just like we can't because it will cause damage. So they need to store it and they can store it in a couple different ways. They can store it as starch. Um, this is like, um, if you had a bunch of like kindergartners running around the playground, wreaking havoc, they would be a lot more easy to control if they were all holding hands. So starch is like a bunch of glucose molecules holding hands. And um, plants that um, store starch can be kind of easily recognized. I mean, all plants store starch. Some store more than others, like a sweet potato or a carrot. Those are going to be um, the more starchy parts of the plants. Then, and, and our bodies can break starch down into sugar. Plants will also take glucose and they'll store it in another form called fiber. And fiber is not something that our bodies can break down. Um, it's the part of plants that give it structure. So plants that are more fibrous, like the lower parts of the asparagus or the um, stalks of kale are gonna be really fibrous. They're gonna be harder to chew and they're harder for us to digest, but they are still important because fiber cleans out our colon and it also feeds our gut microbiome. Plants do a couple other things with glucose. Um, plants that produce uh, fruit are going to uh, change glucose into fructose, which is a lot sweeter, and it's going to attract animals to that seed bearing part of the fruit to help um, disperse those seeds. And so fruit has a lot of fructose in it. It's two times as sweet as glucose. It's also 10 times more damaging to cells. So it glycates cells 10 times as quickly as glucose does. And then the other thing that plants will do is they'll just put glucose and fructose together and that just makes a really efficient storage molecule. That's called sucrose. And that's what we think of as table sugar. So here's a little picture that shows all that. This is from a book called The Glucose Revolution by a woman who goes by um, Glucose Goddess on Instagram. We'll be using some of her um, infographics today. So the sun, um, plants make glucose from energy from the sun and they can turn it into starch, which gets broken down in our body back into glucose. They can make it into sucrose, which gets broken down by our body into glucose and fructose, and they can make it into fiber. And that just goes through our body, cleans out our colon, feeds our microbiome. Emily, you're gonna talk about how to identify a healthy carb. Yes, how do I identify a healthy carb? Because you will hear people just kind of say, you know, blanket terms like I'm doing a low carb diet or I'm not eating carbs right now, but there's a lot of different types of carbs out there. So, um, the biggest thing that I tell people when thinking about carbs and whether or not it's, you know, a healthy carb or not, um, the biggest difference is, did it come from the earth or did it come from a factory or from like a highly refined process? Right. So whole food carbs is, 
um, what I encourage people to focus on. So sweet potatoes, even potatoes, squash, fruit, and whole grains like steel cut oats, quinoa, and wild rice, like as much in their original form as possible. This is different from the refined and processed carbohydrates that you're going to find. Um, these typically come in a box or a package. Um, they line the middle aisles of the grocery store. So you can think of conventional bread, crackers, cookies, chips, baked goods, pasta, and all of these carbohydrates um, have the fiber and the nutrients stripped from them. Um, whereas those whole food carbs like fruits and vegetables and whole grains, they still have all the fiber and they have vitamins attached to them. So just your body, like there's a whole matrix of things going on there where your body's getting the nutrients and it's getting the fiber. Um, and it, it processes those carbohydrates, um, more slowly. Like it's not going to spike your blood sugar as much. Whereas those refined and processed carbohydrates, it has the, uh, fiber, the vitamins and the minerals stripped away. So it's really just a blood sugar spike. Like your body just interprets that, um, as sugar because there's just not as much attached to it. And we also know that most of these processed carbohydrates typically have other ingredients in there that are not so great for us, like added sugars um, and things like that. So that's my biggest tip is like, where did this carbohydrate come from? Great. So once we put those carbohydrates in our body, what does our body do with them? This is where insulin comes in. Um, insulin is a hormone. Hormones are messenger molecules and insulin is made in our pancreas, which is right under our stomach. And its sole purpose in life is to protect us from those damaging effects of just free flowing glucose in the bloodstream. So as soon as our body senses that there's glucose in the bloodstream, our pancreas starts to secrete insulin and insulin signals to our bodies to store glucose, to get it bound up. So it's not roaming freely wreaking havoc. Um, so insulin in and of itself, when it gets too high, can cause damage as well. Um, and we will talk about that later. And so it's good to have insulin, um, under about seven. This is a fasting insulin. Um, this is associated with a lower risk of metabolic syndrome and diabetes. If you look on a lab report, you'll see that the normal range goes up well above 20, but remember normal is not optimal. And so optimal insulin levels are going to be lower. They're going to be typically under seven. So how does our body store glucose? Well, um, we have a process similar to plants creating starch. We have a way to get those little glucose molecules to hold hands so they don't run around like crazy. And that's called glycogen. And we store glycogen in two different types of tissue. We can store up to hundred grams of glucose as glycogen in our liver. That's about 50% of the glucose we need in a given day. That's about the amount of glucose in two large McDonald's fries. <clears throat> now, if we have more than that, we can put it in our muscle. We can put up to 400 grams of glucose as glycogen in our muscle. That's about seven or eight large McDonald's fries. But if we eat more glucose than that in a given day, our body has to do something else with it. It can't have it running around like crazy, but it doesn't have anywhere else to put it as glycogen. So that's when our body turns it into fat. And the type of fat it turns it into is called a triglyceride. You may have seen this on your um, cholesterol report. It's usually reported when, when cholesterol is measured and it's made from sugar. Um, <clears throat> now fructose, remember we talked about fructose. Fructose can only be made into triglycerides. It cannot be made into glycogen. And this is why things like high fructose corn syrup are so problematic because our body can only turn it into fat. And so what happens when we have, you know, our glycogen stores are full, we're just making a bunch of triglycerides with our glucose and our body is constantly getting the signal that we have glucose in the bloodstream. Well, this is when our cells start to ignore our pancreas. And I use the analogy of a mom talking to her kids. If she only tells them every now and then, if she gets stern with them and, and corrects them every now and then they might listen up and pay attention. But if she's constantly talking to them and constantly telling them what to do, um, they start to ignore her. And so then she has to talk louder to get them to pay attention. And that's what happens with our hormones too. When our tissues become resistant to a given hormone, in this case, insulin, the pancreas has to talk louder. So it starts pumping out more insulin and insulin levels start to go up. And eventually um, that leads to diabetes. And um, 
But well before, so if you look at this spectrum, well before you get to diabetes, you can have health problems associated with insulin resistance. Um, it's a, a central feature of aging and chronic disease. Um, we have prediabetes before we have um, diabetes and uh, one in three Americans has prediabetes without knowing it. And then even before that, we can have what's called impaired glucose tolerance, where we have these big blood sugar spikes and our pancreas can't always predict how much insulin to pump out. So sometimes then we get blood sugar crashes and we just don't feel good. So we can, we can be symptomatic down here in this lower range, but not be prediabetic. Um, and now we're going to talk about why that happens, why insulin resistance and elevated blood sugar is associated with chronic disease. We're kind of going to kind of give you a little potpourri of examples and Emily's going to start. Yeah. So this is an image taken from, uh, the glucose goddess on Instagram, which Kelly mentioned, and she has a book and she's really great. Highly re recommend you follow her. Um, she provides a lot of visuals like this. And so I wanted to start, um, by providing you guys with a visual, just be, so we kind of get on the same page with what we're talking about with this, these blood sugar spikes and crashes. So it's commonly referred to as the blood sugar roller coaster, right? So that's when our blood sugar spikes, it goes up and then it comes down. And if you look on these graphs here, um, she does a lot of these comparisons, but we're just going to kind of look at the graph. You see where there's baseline and that's kind of like that healthy blood sugar where we want to be. Anytime we eat a carbohydrate or a sugar, we're going to have a blood sugar response. So you see where that spike comes up and then when it comes back down. So for example, you know, with the hundred calories of store-bought trail mix, um, store-bought trail mix typically has a lot of dried fruit and a lot of added sugar in the form of candies and chocolates and things like that. So you see you're at baseline, you eat your trail mix, and then your blood sugar does come up there into what's considered the spike zone. So that's a little bit high, right? And then over time, the next two hours after a meal, it comes back down and it actually dips below your baseline. And so this is when you're seeing the hypoglycemia, hypoglycemia, where you're kind of experiencing the feelings of low blood sugar, which we'll kind of get into. But, you know, if you've ever been hangry or um, felt a little shaky or brain foggy, that's when you're kind of in that blood sugar dip right there. And then, you know, alternatively, you have the same amount of calories, but you're having dark chocolate and almonds, which has less sugar in it. You're still getting a little bit of a bump there because it, it does have sugar in it. But over time, you're kind of more slowly returning to base level and you're not dipping below your baseline there. And then Kelly, if you flip to the next slide, there's another example there. Um, granola versus cereal, both with skim milk, same amount. Um, you know, the granola typically has more nut seeds. So it's got a little bit more fat, a little bit more protein to help kind of stabilize your blood sugar. Whereas cereal is typically just straight carbohydrates and usually added sugar. Um, so you see, you get a spike with both of them. But then the granola, you return a little bit more gracefully to your baseline there versus the cereal where you're spiking and you're pretty quickly coming down under baseline. So I personally don't know anyone who is full and satisfied off of a bowl of cereal for more than an hour or two. And usually you are hungrier than, you know, before you have the cereal. So now we'll look at how all of that kind of impacts different health outcomes. So cravings and weight gain. So these blood sugar spikes and dips perpetuate cravings and weight gain because when we're, you know, we have that spike and then we come back down. Cereal is a really great example because um, for whatever reason, cereal has really been, um, you know, marketed to us as the ideal breakfast choice in America for, for anybody and especially for kids. Um, when really these cereals are a lot of carbohydrates that are, you know, stripped of the fiber, stripped of the nutrients. And then we, you know, add vitamins back in, fortify them, but we're also usually adding sugar. Sometimes there's dried fruit as well. So we have this spike and then we have this, this come down and it's during that come down when our body kind of goes into alarm mode because we're not at a balance. We're not at our baseline. We're below that baseline. So our body actually wants to bring our blood sugar back up. So it'll send craving that causes cravings for more carbohydrates and more sugars, because those are the quickest sources of energy. And then over time, this can kind of, this can lead to overeating 
and then eventually to weight gain because you know if this is happening every once in a while that doesn't that's not necessarily such a big deal but a lot of us are having these spikes and drops with every meal and every snack that we eat so we're perpetually that's why they call it the roller coaster right we're we're perpetually coming up and coming down and then reaching for the carbohydrates and the sugars to bring ourselves back up, but then you get the spike and you come back down. So over time, um, these cravings can lead to overeating and can lead to weight gain. Um, and then this also, like Dr. Kelly just mentioned about diabetes, um, if we're continuously having these blood sugar spikes and crashes all the time, we become insulin resistant and this can lead to type two diabetes. And then fatigue, a lot of us are really tired. This is one of the biggest um, symptoms and complaints that I hear from my clients and from people in my life. And one of the best ways that we can support our energy levels is through blood sugar regulation. So that fatigue happens again in that crash. So when we come back, you know, we've all probably experienced this getting really tired after a meal that's carb heavy or after a big dessert. Um, it commonly happens in the afternoon where we kind of naturally have an, an energy dip anyways. And then if we have, you know, say like a big sandwich and chips and then like a piece of cake for dessert, that's a lot of carbohydrates and sugar that's going to bring you into a dip. And so that's when you kind of get that, that afternoon slump. And a lot of people turn to either caffeine or more sugar to kind of get us out of that slump. Um, so, so yeah, those spikes and then the dip is when we experience that fatigue, but it keeps us on this, on this cycle of never really feeling stable in our energy levels. And then mental health. So blood sugar regulation is super important, um, for feelings of, emotional well-being and emotional resilience. So if you've ever experienced hanger or perhaps had a disproportionate reaction, if you've ever flipped out on your spouse because you were hungry, you've experienced hanger and you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, so when we're when our blood sugar is down, it can trigger feelings of anxiety. For some people, that can be the sole trigger for anxiety um, and can also increase feelings of stress and just our overall um, emotional resilience. So um, keeping blood sugar stable is one of the best things that we can do. You know, if anxiety is something that we're, we're dealing with or for overall, just trying to, you know, increase our emotional wellness and our emotional resilience. Um, and then the other aspect is that chronically dysregulated blood sugar and insulin, um, also causes a lot of inflammation in our body, which Kelly touched on earlier. And we now know that inflammation is linked to depression. So, um, by continuously having these, you know, this dysregulated blood sugar and insulin that contributes to inflammation, which then can contribute to mood and depression as well. Um, cognition is also affected by blood sugar. So our brain, just like all organs in our body is going to be affected by that oxidative stress created by excess blood sugar. And one of the ways that we can feel this is, um, post, uh, especially in the morning after, um, we wake up from a night of fasting. If we have a really carb heavy breakfast, we can notice a uh, reduction in memory and cognition. That's been one association made, um, in research. <clears throat> um, Alzheimer's disease has a very high association with blood sugar dysregulation to the extent that it's often called diabetes of the brain. So these are just some ways in which we've noticed um, as a scientific community that blood sugar dysregulation affects our cognition. It also affects our sleep. When we go to sleep right after a big glucose spike or with high levels of glucose in our blood, we don't sleep as well. And we are more prone to sleep apnea where we're um, having really brief periods um, of not breathing during the night. And um, you can see this if you wear a continuous glucose monitor, um, you can track that and see if you're dipping into um, hypoglycemia at night, because what happens is if you go to bed with a big um, glucose spike, a lot of times your pancreas will try to um, correct that and it'll overcorrect. And just like Emily um, explained, you'll get, um, you'll get a, a 
drop in blood sugar that will go so low that it may even dip into hypoglycemic levels. And when that happens, that sends an alarm system in your body and, um, and can wake you up so that you, um, would go and, and get food. Um, so sleep is, um, can be highly disrupted by blood sugar as can immune function. So our immune system is temporarily suppressed with each glucose spike. And you can imagine if that's happening throughout the day with every, you know, sweetened beverage and every snack and every carb heavy meal, that's a lot of the day that your immune system is um, not functioning as well as it could be. And when blood sugar is chronically elevated as it is in so many people, um, immune function is just plain reduced and this increases our susceptibility to infections. And we've seen that really dramatically with um, response rates uh, to COVID and, um, and the way that different bodies um, respond to COVID and the increased risk of um, severe disease and death in patients with metabolic disorders who get COVID. Um, insulin resistance and elevated blood sugar are linked to cardiovascular health in a number of ways. One of those ways is that um, just having high insulin in your body can increase your blood pressure. And this diagram is from a book called Why We Get Sick, which is all about how insulin is at the root of so many chronic diseases. Um, there's multiple mechanisms by which insulin can increase blood pressure. Just a couple of them I'll highlight here. Our blood vessels need nitric oxide to expand and insulin actually suppresses nitric oxide. So we have less ability for our blood vessels to expand when we have elevated insulin. Elevated insulin also causes the walls of our blood vessels to get thick. So you have these pipes that are thicker and they can't expand. And that's just going to create tension in those pipes. And that leads to elevated blood pressure. Insulin resistance can also contribute to atherosclerosis, which is the hardening of our blood vessels. What happens is that these spikes in glucose and fructose damage the cells in our blood vessels and they get kind of misshapen. And that makes it easier for the fats that are floating through our bloodstream as a natural process, makes it easier for those fat molecules to get stuck in those blood vessels. And if multiple ones of them, multiple fat molecules get stuck, that's what leads to the narrowing of the arteries. And eventually, oh, if one of those, those arteries can fully close and that's what causes um, a heart attack. Um, elevated insulin will also change the pattern of our cholesterol. So we have LDL cholesterol, which you may have heard of as a bad cholesterol. I don't like to call it that because it's not, it's not bad or good. It's just trying to do its job. We need cholesterol in our body to line our nerves and to make our hormones and our liver makes cholesterol. And we have these little molecules called LDL that are like little cars that carry cholesterol from our liver to our, the rest of our body where, um, where we need it. <clears throat> but when we have too much insulin, the size and shape of those LDL molecules changes and they go from being like large and puffy and floaty, kind of like a beach ball to really small and hard and dense. And those are going to be more prone to be stuck in the arteries. And they'll also cause more damage. If you think about getting hit by a golf ball versus getting hit by a beach ball, that's kind of what's happening inside your blood vessels. Insulin and blood sugar impact our hormone in a number of ways. So both men and women with high glucose levels are more likely to be infertile. Insulin tells our ovaries to produce more testosterone. And in women that can cause a condition called polycystic ovarian syndrome, which not only involves cysts of the ovaries, but also um, involves um, things like thinning of hair, facial hair, acne. Um, these are This is um, a hormonal condition, but at its root, it's a metabolic condition because it's caused by elevated insulin. And then if you um, tuned in last month to our library talk, I talked about estrogen a lot. Estrogen dominance is a condition where there's an imbalance of estrogen to progesterone and you can get symptoms like heavy menstrual bleeding, painful menstrual cramps, PMS. So we can be more prone to this imbalance in hormones when we have excess testosterone caused by too much insulin. That testosterone can be converted into estrogen. And then... Um, in perimenopause, um, women who uh, with high glucose and insulin levels are more prone to hot flashes and night sweats. 
Insulin and blood sugar, they just make everything, everything worse when they're too high. And that includes cancer. First of all, many cancers begin with DNA damage caused by free radicals. As I talked about at the beginning, we make more free radicals when we have excess blood, excess glucose in our blood. And then inflammation promotes cancer cell generation or proliferation and glucose feeds our own cells, but it also feeds cancer cells. So for all these reasons, elevated blood sugar is not, um, not good for cancer and preventing cancer. And then we have a process called inflammaging, which is essentially just the result of a lifetime of low grade chronic inflammation, which damages our tissue slowly over time. Um, and this is related to blood sugar because those free radicals produced by excess glucose cause an increased inflammation, which causes tissue damage. And then that glycation that I taught or gly yeah, glycation that I talked about, um, when those glucose molecules hit other molecules, um, and cause damage, that is a process behind aging. That's one of the processes that drives aging. And an example is, um, collagen, when glucose, when collagen molecules are glycated and they get stiff, um, they're essentially broken and damaged. And when we have multiple damaged collagen molecules, we get wrinkles. All right. So what can we do about this? It's not all doom and gloom because these conditions, insulin resistance and elevated blood sugar are really responsive to lifestyle changes. So we have a lot of, um, really good suggestions for you starting with diet. Yeah. So that's the great news is that a lot of this, you know, there's a lot of things that we can do and we have more control over it than we think. So, um, with diet, number one thing, and I always like to remind people food is one of the most powerful things that we have, um, control over when it comes to our health and especially with blood sugar. And I love to tell people like every, every next thing you put in your mouth, every next meal, every next snack, that's an opportunity to, you know, work on your blood sugar, support healthy blood sugar levels. So you can start now, you can start tomorrow. Um, but something to just start thinking about, um, focus on protein and healthy fats at every meal and snack. Um, of course it's not realistic to do it every time, all of the time, but as long as you're kind of you know, the 80, 20 rule works well for a lot of people. So as long as 80% of the time you're doing this, you're going to really be supporting your blood sugar levels. Um, so protein and fat don't require an insulin response from our body in normal amounts. So they're going to keep your blood sugar really balanced. And when I say healthy fats, I mean, things like nuts, seeds, olive oil, coconut products, um, wild caught fatty fish, um, olives, things like that. Right. And then protein, you know, there's, um, animal based sources and plant-based sources, animal based sources will, um, are, are just protein, whereas plant-based sources will still have some carbohydrates attached to them. Um, so make that the focus on every meal and every snack as often as you can. And then another really cool thing is that the order in which you eat your foods can impact your blood sugar. So just by eating some vegetables first, preferably some green vegetables, you're creating kind of like a fiber matrix in your gut, and that's going to help regulate your blood sugar and reduce glucose spikes, no matter what you're eating afterwards. So, um, veggies first protein second, and then your starches and carbs last. So if you were having a dinner of um, salad, sweet potato fries, and a piece of chicken, you would want to start with your salad then you'd want to eat your chicken and have your sweet potato fries last. And just by doing that, you're going to cut your glucose spike versus, you know, starting out eating all your sweet potato fries first. Um, so this is just an easy thing to do. It's, it's not always going to be convenient, right? Like if you're eating, um, a burger or a taco or something like that, that you don't need to deconstruct your burger or your taco so that you do this, just do it, you know, when it's convenient and, um, when it makes sense. Um, and then another cool thing, which you may have heard of, cause this is kind of a, an, a old health thing that's been going around for a while. Um, but having some vinegar before your meals can really help cut glucose spikes as well. So having about a tablespoon of apple cider vinegar and a little bit of water before your meal, um, works really well. Or, and this is something that I like doing is just adding vinegar to my salad dressing and then having that be the first part of my meal. So you could do like a red wine vinegar, even a balsamic vinegar, 
Um, so that combination of vinegar and then having the, the vegetables before, you know, your, your other components of your meal can be really powerful for supporting blood sugar levels as well. And then movement. So in general, exercise makes us more insulin sensitive. Um, so our, you know, our muscles are what draw up the sugar that is in floating around in our blood. So um, when we make regular exercise a part of our routine, it can help increase our insulin sensitivity and support blood sugar levels. And then like Kelly mentioned earlier, we have a certain amount of um, sugar that can be stored in our muscles, right? And so the more lean muscle we have too, the more room we have to, to store the sugar as well. So um, regular exercise can be super powerful. It doesn't have to even be crazy intense. Walking's great. Um, just making it a regular part of your day and a regular part of your lifestyle can be really supportive. Um, as I mentioned, our blood sugar is impacted by our sleep, but our sleep is also, our sleep also impacts how insulin resistant we are. And this has been demonstrated in a number of studies, one of which showed that just a week of um, insufficient sleep could make a body 30% more insulin resistant as compared to normal sleep. And then there was another study that showed for that napping for over an hour a day can increase insulin resistance. So um, it's recommended to sleep at least seven hours a night and to try to get the bulk of your sleep um, in the evening. So following your circadian rhythm, um, when you don't do that, you can notice a dramatic um increase in your insulin sensitivity. And then stress is huge also for insulin sensitivity and um, the release of glucose into our bloodstream. Our stress response um, has evolved over all of the course of animal evolution to really be um, uh, a great tool for getting away from danger. So um, when we're stressed out, our body's optimized for running away. And part of that optimization means that cortisol, our stress hormone will signal to our body, our liver and our muscles to release that glycogen, to release that sugar that it stored, those little glucose molecules that are holding hands, cortisol will tell our body to let them go and just let them be free because it's anticipating that we're going to need to use those. Um, however, in modern life, and a lot of our stress is not caused by things that we can run away from. They're caused by other issues like our work and our relationships and even our environment can be stress, uh, create stress in our bodies. And, uh, and when that happens, our liver and our muscles are still releasing that glycogen and turning it back into glucose. And that just creates and exacerbates that condition of excess glucose in our body. So we're gonna wrap it up with just a handful of really practical tips that you can use to um, make a significant difference in your blood sugar on a regular basis. Um, Emily. So first is the PFF breakfast. That stands for protein, fat, and fiber. And breakfast, when it comes to blood sugar regulation, breakfast honestly is the most important meal because that sets you up for what your blood sugar is going to look like for the rest of the day. Um, so I really emphasize um, the importance of a blood sugar balancing breakfast, right? Because if we start out with that bowl of cereal, we have the spike, we have the dip, and then we're just trying to course correct all day. And we kind of, we end up on this roller coaster. So by starting out with a really blood sugar balancing breakfast, that's going to reduce your cravings right off the bat, give you more sustained energy and just have you feeling a lot better. So some combination of protein, a healthy fat, and a fiber is where you want to be at with your breakfast. Um, so one of the major um, hurdles, I guess, <laughs> when explaining this to people is we have to kind of break past the ideas of what breakfast is supposed to be because in America, we're so used to these sweet breakfasts, like we're pastries, muffins, um, cereals, bagels, like these carb heavy breakfasts, right? That's kind of what we're all accustomed to. And for whatever reason, sometimes the idea of eating something else like 
kind of freaks us out. And we're like, no, I can't have that for breakfast. That's what I have for dinner. Um, but you can eat whatever you want for breakfast. Like we're, we're all adults. We can eat whatever we want for breakfast and it's okay to have, um, leftovers or, you know, just redefine it and choose some, choosing something, um, more savory is going to automatically set you up for more stable glucose. So I've just included some of my favorite examples of this type of breakfast that incorporates the protein, fat, and fiber. Um, that I recommend to my clients all the time. So um, a favorite of mine is eggs, avocado, and kimchi. Kimchi is fermented vegetables, in case you didn't know. Um, so you get an added bonus there with some probiotic vegetables. Um, sausage and roasted veggies. This is a staple that I come back to um, a lot. And, you know, roasted veggies can be anything that you like. It can be sweet potatoes, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, some onions, um, and then whatever kind of sausage you like. And I honestly feel, I think I feel my best when I'm having a breakfast that has vegetables in it like this with some sort of protein. Um, avocado toast for those who like the avocado toast. Um, I recommend when it comes to bread, I recommend sourdough toast, not only because it's easier to digest because it's fermented, um, but it also has a lesser impact on our blood sugar. So that avocado provides plenty of fat and fiber as well. So that's going to keep your blood sugar levels more stable. And then if you prefer a sweeter breakfast, I love chia pudding with fruit and nut butter. Um, so chia pudding, chia seeds are these small seeds that um, kind of gel up when you add liquid to them. So Usually I mix them with um, some non-dairy milk or whatever kind of milk that you like. And it creates kind of like a pudding slash yogurt consistency and then adding some fresh fruit and then some nut butter. So whether that's peanut butter, almond butter, sunflower seed butter. Um, but this is actually a really great blood sugar balancing breakfast. That's a little bit on the sweeter side if you prefer a sweeter breakfast. Cool. And then... Building on that and what um, Emily said about, you know, eating foods in a certain order, I like to tell my patients to dress your carbs. So um, by dressing your carbs, I mean, eat your carbs with fat and protein um, because they slow down the breakdown of those carbohydrates and they'll flatten the, the glucose curve. So when I'm talking about carbohydrates, I'm talking, I'm still talking about fruit, potatoes, um, these are foods that might be whole foods, they might be healthy foods, but they still have um, a lot of sugar in them. And it's important to um, dress them so that you break them down more slowly. And here's a couple examples from the glucose goddess. Um, she uses a continuous glucose monitor, which is a little device you can put in your shoulder. It measures your blood sugar constantly for two weeks. So it's a fun tool to see how your body responds to different foods. And so here's her um, body responding to just a bowl of rice. You can see her um, blood sugar spikes well above those 30 points above baseline, which is considered to be um, uh, um, a excessive response. So her blood sugar is almost going up 60 points above her baseline when she just has that white rice. Whereas when she has her rice with avocado, it's less of a spike and it also breaks down more slowly. Now this happens even with healthy food um, like fruit. Um, her, when she's just having melon, her blood sugar will also spike well above those 30 points above baseline. However, when she adds a little bit of protein to that, look how big of a difference it makes in her blood sugar spike. It doesn't spike nearly as high and stays well under that 30, um, 30 point uh, range. So, um, yeah, dressing your carbs is a really, a really important, um, way to prevent those blood sugar spikes, but also to make your snack or whatever it is you're eating, um, sustain you longer so you don't get hungry as quickly. And then another really great tip is to move after a meal. And it used to be thought that you needed to move for at least 10 minutes after a meal to impact your blood sugar. But just the other week, um, there was some research that came out that showed that even just moving for two to five minutes within um, 70 minutes of eating um, can help reduce your blood sugar spikes. So that's because if you think about um, that sugar being released into the blood, if your body is using it up, if your little engine driver is um, sh shoveling that coal straight into the engine, you're not going to need to store as much and you won't have so much as a of a spike because you're going to be using it up. So here's a um, a diagram from the glucose goddesses book, and it shows the difference between just having a piece of cake and no exercise 
and then having a piece of cake and walking or taking a hike afterwards. And you can see her glucose spike is much less because she's using that glucose right away. So this is a really easy thing to implement. You can have your lunch at work and then just walk up and down the stairs in your office, walk around the block with some friends. You don't have to go out and do an hour long workout. You can walk for just two to five minutes. This can also be just getting up from the table and going to clean the kitchen or going to fold the laundry um, or throwing a ball with your kid um, instead of just going down to sit down and watch TV. So um, just moving your body within 70 minutes of eating a meal makes a really big difference in your blood sugar. Um, all right, so for anyone who wants to take a deeper dive into these issues with either myself or Emily, you can schedule with us at Ripple and here's our contact information. You're gonna be getting these slides um, as a follow-up email. And then at Ripple, we're also offering a blood sugar regulation package. This is a package I am really excited to offer because it's um, something I really like to do with patients. Um, and now we've put it in a package, so it's a little bit easier and patients have more incentive to stick with the program. Um, this includes a, a pre um, continuous glucose monitor visit where we um, I sit down and take an intake, hear about your diet and lifestyle. And then I'm going to prescribe a continuous glucose monitor, which is one of those little discs they told you that stays in your shoulder and monitors your blood sugar over um, the course of two weeks. And um, this is so helpful because so much of this is generalizations. We don't know exactly how your body responds, especially because it's so variable, depends on your sleep and your stress levels and even what time, uh, what stage in your menstrual cycle you're at, if you're before your period or after your period, if you're a menstruating woman. Um, and you, as you can see, different foods will impact you in different ways, depending on the order in which you eat them or what you're doing when you eat them. And so having a continuous glucose monitor can be a really great way to gain insight into some, into how, what you normally do impacts your blood sugar. And when I've done this with patients, they're always surprised to see things that they thought were healthy, um, really spiking their blood sugar. And then the great thing is, is that then we get back together, we review that data. Data, and then we can troubleshoot, we can implement some of these ideas and um, then go back and try another one. So each, each continuous glucose monitor kit comes with two discs so you can collect a month worth of data. So I usually have people just kind of live their normal life and try all the things like try your favorite candy, try your favorite restaurant, try all the things you really like and see what it does to your blood sugar. And then with the next disc, you're really trying to implement these lifestyle changes and see the difference it makes and see if you can keep your blood sugar relatively steady. So we're offering this package. Um, we, Ripple just sent out a, a newsletter about it. So if you're on the email list, you'll have gotten that. And if you have any questions about it, or you want to purchase a package, um, you can use this contact info and, um, and um, get in touch with Ripple. And then finally, one more opportunity for taking a deep dive into health. I am leading a, um, a retreat focused on gut and hormone health in the Methow Valley up in Northeastern Washington by the Canadian border. It's a really beautiful part of the state. Um, that's gonna be next week. We close registration in two days, but there's still a couple of days to sign up if you are interested at all in taking a deep dive into your gut and hormone health, which is very much um, impacted by blood sugar and blood sugar impacts our hormone and gut health very directly as well. Then there's information on that as well. And now we will, oh, one more thing. The next topic in our wellness series through the Camus Library is gonna be understanding your cycle, what your menstrual cycle can tell you about your health. I'll be doing that with um, one of our acupuncturists. So um, if you're interested in that, that's on Wednesday, October 12th. If there's any young women in your life, I really encourage you to um, invite them to watch this because um, it's, I just think it's so important for young women to, to learn about their menstrual cycle and what it's telling them and not to think that they have to go through their life um, suffering from heavy, heavy and painful periods. Um, okay, and with that, um, we're going to open it up to questions. It looks Hi. Like we, oh, sorry. It looks like we had one in the chat um, and yeah. asked, can you talk about intermittent fasting for blood sugar control? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, um, I can talk a little bit about that and, and Emily probably can as well. It's um, intermittent fasting is um, 
there's lots of different ways to do it. It's simply, it's, it's essentially time restricting. You're, you're narrowing the window in which you eat. Sometimes you're narrowing that to just an eight hour window, um, or some people will, um, extend their fast as long as, you know, 24 hours. Um, there's many different ways to do it and you can do it, um, quite easily by just doing a 12 hour fast. So having a break between dinner and breakfast, that's 12 hours. And this has been shown in research to be really helpful at regulating blood sugar and, um, um, making us less insulin resistant. So making us more sensitive to insulin. And one of the reasons it does that is because it just lower, it just reduces the amount of, um, glucose spikes that we go through throughout the day. And it gives our body more time, um, without, um, you know, elevated levels of blood sugar. Emily, did you want to add things, any info to that? Yeah, I'll just add one thing. Um, and that is that it still matters what you're eating during your eating window, because I've seen intermittent fat. I've heard a lot of people talk about intermittent fasting and they're like, yeah, it's so great. I just, I, you know, don't eat for 16 hours of the day. And then I just kind of eat whatever I want, you know, and that kind of defeats the purpose in my opinion. So I think it's a really useful tool, but I think it also matters what you're eating within those hours. So keep that in mind too, like just because you are intermittent fasting is not a license to necessarily eat whatever you want within those, um, feeding hours. If your goal is health and, um, and blood sugar control. Yeah. I have a question. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I like white rice. I sometimes eat like a half a cup with something. Is that I just a poor choice. I mean, I'll eat it with um, like salad with chicken in it, you know, with some, you know, some oil and vinegar or something. What do you think of that choice, putting a half a cup of rice in that? I think that that is okay, especially if it's something that you really enjoy. And there's a couple cool things about rice. So um, this is kind of like a hack for white rice and potatoes and other starchy things. And it's when you cook and cool these items, they, they develop more resistant starch, which our body can't digest. So you actually have a little bit of a lesser um, glucose spike from that as well. So if you're eating like leftover rice and it's, it's cool, or it's only been mildly reheated, you're going to have less of a glucose um, impact from that. But I think also if you implement, you know, some of the tips that we talked about earlier where, you know, you're eating vegetables first or you're eating it alongside protein and fat, you're going to be minimizing um, the glucose spike. It's going to come down to, you know, your individual goals and your individual health and how it impacts you. But I think that you can reasonably incorporate it um, by, you know, eating the vegetables first and combining it with some protein and some fat. And I have a two-part question real quick. So I like to eat an apple with almond butter. Is that a good choice? Yeah, that's a really good example of dressing your carbs. So you're um, adding fat and protein with that almond butter to your to the carbohydrate in the apple. So that should um, flatten the sugar spike in that. But you can tell what I would encourage you to do is pay attention to how you feel one to two to three to four hours after your meal with white rice or after your snack with apple and almond butter. Because if you start to feel um, signs of low blood sugar um, relatively quickly after eating those, then um, that's a sign that your body may be dipping into hypoglycemia. Whereas if you have a meal with white rice and you feel fine, you feel energetic and you're sustained, you're not hungry for another four hours, then that's a sign that your body is tolerating that pretty well. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, Glenn, if you're trying to ask, yeah, there we go. We got to take you off mute. Go. Oh, there you go. You yeah. Excellent. <clears throat> I have a smoothie, which is kind of a hybrid. It has blueberries and dates, so there's my sugars, but it has an avocado and two big handfuls of spinach, mm -hmm. plus almond milk and coconut, and I pour in raw cacao powder and protein powder, 
So mm -hmm. this, this monster is, is a hybrid. Where mm -hmm. would that fit in the meal? Should I eat a salad before I drink this monster? <laughs> <laughs> or what would you do with this? Yeah. Well, as far as smoothies go, those are like one of the big things that people think are healthy and then, you know, end up having a lot of sugar. But I really like that you're adding the avocado and the protein to it. That's my top recommendation for anyone who does enjoy smoothies. And I think they are a great vehicle to like get extra greens and um, kind of get a lot of nutrients in one meal. So the way that you're doing it, you know, adding the fat and adding the protein is going to be the most blood sugar friendly option, you know, and then choosing lower glycemic fruits like berries, the blueberries are great. Dates are high in sugar. They also have fiber and minerals in them too. So there's a little bit of a trade-off. And if it's adding that sweetness, um, I would say like, you know, if you were going to make a tweak to make it more blood sugar friendly, I would take out those dates or just reduce the number of dates in there. Uh -huh. um, but I think that could be a meal all on its own. Alternatively, um, I do this sometimes I might have some protein before a smoothie. So I might have like um, a little uh -huh. bit of animal protein or like a hard boiled egg or a couple eggs and avocado or something. You could have that before your smoothie too, to even further uh -huh. support sugar yeah, yeah by the way that is just an absolutely delicious smoothie yeah. but uh but i, I like to have an half of an avocado and some tomato before i have the smoothie and have it with sausage it's yeah. great great that probably works really well for you kelly do you have opinions on smoothies or does that work for you too no, that works. I mean, it, it, like you said, it can be a really good vehicle for getting those seven to 12 servings of fruits and veggies that we're trying to get a day. But I always like just recommend um, low glycemic fruits and have more heavy on the vegetables and make sure there's fat and protein on it. But if you do that, and if, again, you can tell if you're, if you feel, if you drink that smoothie and you don't feel hungry for a couple hours, then that was a good smoothie. If you drink that smoothie and you feel hungry, um, within an hour or two, then it probably was causing your blood sugar to dip. Um, so just tune into your body and notice how you feel. And, um, that'll give you some indication as to whether or not it's working for you. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks Glenn. How about uh, water and how much and where it's drunk throughout the day? Yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't know how water impacts blood sugar directly, although just having a lot of water in your stomach can slow down digestion, but not in a, not in a helpful way necessarily. But um, certainly staying hydrated throughout the day is really important. Um, I don't, uh, I, I tend, I don't have, you know, spots in the day where I tell people to drink water. It's more where I encourage people not to drink water is don't drink a ton of water right before you eat or right before you go to sleep, find other times in your day to get your water intake in. And then I typically tell people to aim for two liters of water a day, but that does vary depending on your size and how much you exercise and how much coffee and alcohol you drink. Emily, do you have any more specific guidelines for water? Um, when it comes to blood sugar, I do know that hydration is really important for our blood sugar levels. Um, I don't, I'm not going to get into, I don't know exactly how to articulate how, but, um, but I do know that it's important for the blood sugar levels. Um, as far as, you know, I, I agree with you, like whenever you're going to drink the water, don't drink a lot around meals. And, you know, kind of the general recommendation is that half your body weight in ounces per day in water um, is a good measure for most people, but it's also going to depend on your activity level, um, the weather, how hot it is and things like that. So you're, you got to kind of tune into your body cues on that as well. But I think that's like a really good <clears throat> And so, you know, if you're 150 pounds, 75 ounces is kind of like a good baseline to, to try to get to. And one way you can tell if you're dehydrated is the color of your urine. So if your mm -hmm. urine um, is dark or strong smelling, then you're likely dehydrated, whether, whereas if it's a clear, then you're drinking plenty of water. Yeah. And what is your take on statins to lower cholesterol? 
Well, I, I have a patient population that is biased towards using lifestyle. So I always, and I, I um, often am seeing patients whose cholesterol levels aren't um, sort of through the roof. They're just mildly elevated. So in my patient population, I always start with lifestyle. That's the recommendation anyway, in any medical practice is to start with lifestyle um, give the patient an opportunity to bring, um, lipid levels down with lifestyle. Although I will say that over half of people who walk into a hospital, having a heart attack, have normal lipid levels. And so it's, um, it really is not, um, the marker of cardiovascular disease that, um, we've traditionally kind of thought it to be. Um, and kind of when you do a lipid panel, looking not just at the LDL and HDL cholesterol, but looking at the size and shape of those molecules and looking at things like triglycerides and ratio of triglycerides to total cholesterol, looking at insulin. Um, insulin is, is um, in some ways considered as great or greater risk factor for heart disease as um, than lipids. So um, I don't prescribe statins to my patients because um, we're using lifestyle and um, in some cases we're using supplements to help bring that down. But, you know, if, if you have familial hyper, hypercholesterolemia, if you're really struggling, um, to implement those lifestyle changes, then you can, you know, statins will bring down your LDL cholesterol levels. That's not going to fully reduce your cardiovascular risk though. If you're not treating the underlying causes of that, then you can still be at risk of heart disease, even if you have normal lipid levels. I actually have something else if it's okay. Yeah. Okay. Two things. One, I've, I've got the glucose uh, revolution, I've read it oh. twice, and I, my lipids have gone from all in the red to all in the green just by lifestyle change. That's so great. Thank you yeah. for sharing that. What a great. So that, and not only that, but I had a four year uh, chronic cough. And it's gone. Oh, yay. Oh, my gosh. What can I say? Such a good example of inflammation being reduced by balancing your blood sugar. Yeah. And then my other question is fruit juice. I mean, vegetable juices. Mm. I've got a juicer. I love juicing beets and carrots and celery and tomatoes and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But, I, of course, you're not getting any fiber. No. Are you getting a big dose of glucose when you do vegetable juices? It depends on the veggie, but sweet veggies like beets and carrots, you will be getting quite a bit of sugar. Um, mm -hmm. If you're doing like lettuce and celery and um, cucumbers, not so much. It's a mix. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's one of those things like you could always like if I do, I don't do a lot of fruit juice, but if I do, I will do it after a meal in smaller amounts. And that's mm. like the best way to have it to support the blood sugar. But I think there is, um, I think there is value in juice because you are getting a lot of the nutrients and quickly absorbed because your body doesn't have to digest them. So that can be really good for, for certain people and populations. Um, but yeah, focus, if you want, you know, optimal blood sugar support, focus on the green vegetables. So like mm -hmm. cucumber, celery, lettuces, um, ginger, lemon, ginger and lemon can make it like really a lot more palatable. Um, mm -hmm. you know, if you're, if you're kind of put off by the super green taste, ginger and lemon will help that a lot. Okay. Any questions? Mm -hmm. All right. Anybody else have a question? Thank you so much. You're welcome. Both of yeah. you. Thanks so much for joining us. Yes, thank Bye. you very much. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thanks for coming. Thanks for sharing your story, Glenn. That was really inspiring. Yeah, that was very cool. Yeah. Well, thanks so much to everyone who came. I did see a question that um, asked where the slides were going to come from, and I'm going to email those to Vanessa at the library. So all the post. Um, post talk materials will come from the canvas library yeah and, if and you do what was what was the book he said uh it was um 
Glucose, Glucose Revolution. Revolution. Yeah, it's a really great um, practical guide to lowering your blood sugar. Is is that actually at the library? <laughs> it is. I while we were <laughs> while the presentation was going on, I went and looked up both books that you talked about, and we do have um, Why We Get Sick, and we also have the Glucose Revolution, and that's available um, both as a book in the library and also as um, an audio book and an ebook through the Libby app. And if you need help um, using the Libby app, you can always give us a call at the library and we'll help get you set up. Okay, cool. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us and Canvas Library for having us. Thank you all Thank so you. much, and I will be in touch tomorrow with the recording and um, the notes I will pass along as well. Everyone have a wonderful evening. Thank okay. you. Thanks, Thank you. Good night. Bye. 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 Thanks, Emily. Thanks, Vanessa. Good night. Adios.